audience. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm the gaming editor at Recode.net. Uh, and just running down the line here, so Dave Chavez is CTO of ZSpace. Uh, Brian Seltzer is VP of Business Development at Daiquiri. Did Correct. I, okay, cool. <laughs> Kano Rusamano is uh, CEO of OpenBCI. And Stefano Baudassi is the head of user research at Meta. So we've got a lot to cover panel, but sort of real quick and then run down the line, if you could just tell us how you first got into working in AR. Now, Dave, last time you and I talked, you called it VR, what ZSpace is doing. So I don't know what the hell you're doing here, but maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be a big surprise. Yeah. yeah we, we think of uh, our, our VR on a desktop. So, so it, it, and I think as we talk later, uh, to me, the, the boundaries between VR and, and AR aren't, aren't so clear. Yeah. But uh, let me leave it there, and it, it's back there if you, any of you want to see it. So when did you first start doing? Uh, oh, it's you... been five or six years since we took the idea of a cave and tried to put it all together in a package that you could put on the desk. And Brian, how about you? So I'm a 20-year digital media guy, mostly focused on mobile media for the last 10 years, bringing a lot of big IP to mobile. So I was always looking at emerging platforms. Uh, in 2009, when AR could first be experienced on a mobile device, on a consumer device, was that sort of aha moment to jump into the space. So pretty much an early adopter, early uh, investor into the space. Uh, had a previous company called Augmento that was a VC-backed games company. And we were out there showing AR with not, you know, not with fiducial markers, with natural feature tracking, pretty high um, advanced stuff, early in the space, clearly, um, working with some IP and experimenting and learning a lot. And I uh, love the technology so much, I doubled down with Daiquiri, uh, where I'm at now. And uh, Daiquiri's doing some amazing things, taking it to the next level on the enterprise level. Connor? Sure, so I, I mean, I come to this panel from more of a EEG biosampling perspective. Um, but I did a lot of work in uh, virtual worlds and using Unity and Second Life as an undergrad. So I've, throughout the course of my introduction into EEG, I've been very passionate and kind of followed along on the peripherals. So, Stefano? So as for myself, uh, you introduced me as a head of user research. Uh, my, my background is actually uh, human perception, perceptual performance uh, in a, uh, academia. A and this is a, how we see user research at Meta, is, is a deep like research a, a twist to the user research, uh, very like human, uh, human neuroscience uh, integrated research platform. This is how we approach our, our users. And as a matter of fact, my story is, is serendipitous because I was uh, browsing the Italian news uh, in my lab at Stanford uh, when I uh, figured out from the uh, Forbes uh, 30 under 30 list of this uh, guy, our CEO, Marin Gribbets, who was part of this uh, pool of 30 uh, tech under 30 guys. And, and I sent him an email, and this is where my, my new life uh, starts. But I'm introducing Maron because I'm apologizing for uh, his absence. But a very last minute big thing is happening that I can, uh, wish I could tell you more, and, and he couldn't make the panel today. But I represent the, uh, the, the research, and, and, and I think I'm a good representative for this panel today. Thank you. Great. So to get things started, let's actually talk about that difference between VR and AR and kind of how important or not that is. Uh, I mean, kind of in the past year, it seems like virtual reality has really gained a lot more mainstream attention. We've got all these headsets that are coming to consumers within the next year. Uh, but then also AR, it's also been a big year for AR with a lot of kind of new announcements, new products related to that. So I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, so what makes augmented reality different and how important is that difference? So, well, Extremely. <laughs> Extremely? Yeah. I mean, I'll jump right in. I, yeah, mean, I think the, the key word for me is context when you look at the difference between the two. Um, when you think of, and, and transparency as well, when you think about virtual reality, it's a, uh, an experience, a content experience that you can completely control. I think that's why we're going to see the first successes, big successes commercially come out with VR because you can create the entire digital experience and uh, you know, you're creating a, uh, a game or some kind of environment that's all digital, it's all controlled, you're completely immersed in that experience. Um, when you open up that transparency, you're basically putting a camera looking at the external world. You're now, and using uh, transparent lenses, you're now going into the augmented reality area, and it's about context. It's about that digital content, how it correlates, how it pertains to your environment. Uh, and that's where the truly, I think, impactful and meaningful augmented reality is going to come, where there's an understanding of your environment, and you're getting digital content based on that understanding. So it's more challenging because of that, because you now have to understand where you are, what you're looking at, all the physics that come with that, the recognition of objects, um, and the information 
uh, pertaining to that. And so you're now connecting to the Internet of Things and sensors and data and pulling all that content. And so at DACRA, actually, we call it 4D, the media of 4D, and basically just taking the idea of three-dimensional content, now giving it time and space relevance and what you can do with content with that paradigm. Uh, so there's definitely a clear difference between the two when it comes to the context of the content as it pertains to the real world. Yeah, I can, I can add to that. I'm, I'm, I fully agree with that. I can add to that that, for example, in the context of, of this uh, audience, uh, think about delivering like a, a rehabilitation of a, of a neuro training uh, experience uh, to a patient or even to like a, to elderly people and, and mediating that through a 2D uh, standard like tablet or even a, a VR headset. Uh, when they will have to transition, that's this big issue of generalizability of this uh, training. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a big uh, thread in this literature. Uh, in, with AR, what you can do is to transition a patient, for example, from the digital augmentation that leads to uh, uh, treatment back to the reality by tracking the performance and, and making sure that the performance goes back to reality. This is what AR can, can uh, enable, and it's, uh, and it's unique in this uh, sense. Connor, tell us a little bit about the current state of, of BCI and how that applies to, to AR, sort of those sensors. Sure. Um, well, I think we're all, we're all excited about, I think it came up on a panel yesterday, yesterday morning, about this kind of super product, right, of the combination of biosignals and AR and having a fully immersive experience where you have positive feedback loops with your, your neural activity and the information that's being provided or the, your experience and your interaction with the world is and with the extension of your consciousness, the, you know, the, the computer or the, the memory and the processing beyond what we have physically inside of our head is more seamless. Um, and I think that's, that's one thing that really excites me about augmented reality specifically. I mean, I think that VR um, has the potential for immense research, research especially immersive research. Um, but AR has this potential to, uh, to take our, the, the virtual world that we live inside of probably eight to 10 hours a day, the desktop that we're staring at, and make it uh, appear in the peripherals so that we can choose to engage with what we want to, um, therefore improving our interaction with the computation beyond our mind, but also improving, improving the human experience by putting us face to face with people again and enabling us to stand upright while we engage with technology. So. And Dave, I think you can probably speak a lot to that in terms of the, the sort of social aspect while we're interacting with technology. I mean, tell us a bit about sort of what ZSpace is doing and the, the kind of the, the means of input uh, that you're working with. Yeah, so we've got this uh, kind of desktop system that's a, uh, uh, we call it VR. We call it VR on a desk and there's this interaction device and, and uh, the user wears these real like glasses. So there's not uh, so much social isolation. People can work together and look at each other and, and and that's a really powerful aspect of it, as we all know, right, as, as we're dealing with VR and AR. Um, I think, and, and one thing is, I, I experienced the ZSpace unbelievable, amazing. just the, the zero latency, just the in totally immersive experience and the ability to manipulate objects in 3D. Um, and I think, like, for learning and a lot of the use cases that you have on the board, it's an amazing application for teaching and dissecting things that normally would be messy or require pieces it's all amazing. over the place. And we found uh, that just it's a great marriage. It's a great application. We're putting them in the classrooms today, and you can imagine fifth graders learning about cell yeah. biology or Newtonian mechanics. And Absolutely. But actually, can I, can I comment on the, the distinct, distinction between VR and AR a little bit? Sure, I, go maybe for it. maybe yeah, that's great. challenge you guys a little bit. To me, I think it's a little bit artificial. I think, I think they're, they're two sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. I think. And, and let's say that I'm rendering this virtual world and then I insert uh, some reality into it. I mm -hmm. insert some context of the room. Is, it, is that now not virtual reality anymore? Is, so I, I think that, that the line is really a little more blurry than, than we might think. And when, when we talk about VR, we think about you know, complete immersion, but maybe that doesn't make sense in a lot of cases. I, I think, I think you want to know kind of where you are, and you want to interact with real objects. And, and so I think we're going to find that, there, as I said, two, two sides of the same coin, I, I think. Yeah. I think we all agree on it. It's interesting to see, you know, Microsoft launched HoloLens, and they avoided the augmented reality term altogether mm -hmm. and went with holograms if you want to technically look at it, is it a hologram or not. So it's really finding the right terminology that resonates with people um, to really express what falls under maybe immersive media and um, just having digital 
uh, digital and reality blending in a way yeah. that's undescribable, and we're all trying to describe it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's interesting that you're calling your device virtual reality, really, because you know you're wearing the transparent lenses and you're interacting with the world and people. Like you said, it's very social, mm -hmm. um, so you're, it's not the typical virtual reality experience where you do feel a little isolated in that experience. Um, so yeah, we're we're all kind of looking at terms around that. You know, I'm I'm grasping to the. Uh, digital objects in the real world, you know, um, as an augmented reality experience for the sake of, uh, you know, defining it as a difference to being completely in an immersive experience and just trying to find, you know. But I do think it's a level of transparency, right? It's just, we'll be able to tune that dial in the future, if you will, with a head-mounted display and go to a completely opaque, to a completely transparent back and forth, I believe, you know. And, unless we get bogged down in too much semantics, I mean, this, that actually terminology yeah. does matter for sort of the people you're trying to reach, right? right. With sort of both, on both the consumer level and the enterprise level. I mean, um, I, I guess, actually, well, real quick, back to HoloLens, maybe if you go, I could speak to, I mean, with Microsoft getting into something that's sort of like AR, even if they're not calling it AR, mm -hmm. you have uh, Google investing in Magic Leap, you have all sorts of, you know, these, you know, big you know, consumer household name companies that are they're working in this. I mean, how, how, is, how have those sorts of, uh, you know, uh, entrances affected your, your respective work in, in AR? So the, the um, big attention by, by the big players, is mm -hmm. that your question? Yes. Uh, it, it's just, I, what I would uh, say is that it's just a um, uh, kind of validation that our paradigm is, is a direction to go. And if we talk about the trajectory of these technologies in, in one, three, five, or ten years from now, probably we can uh, think about this uh, as a replacement of, of all the devices that we currently have, mm -hmm. the, the, our, our, our laptop, our phone, our tablet, because the, the technology and the challenges that both like the current VR world and AR world that are partially distinct, uh, for example, the, the latency and the registration, those are two topics that are uh, partially distinct between uh, us and, and the uh, virtual reality world, they will probably converge. There will be, there will be uh, one as challenges, and, and, and at that point, those, the, 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 this technology will, will be ubiquitous and will be the computing device. Rest of panel, do you agree? Uh, I think I agree. I mean, I look at it from a uh, hardware standpoint, platform standpoint. So clearly Microsoft is on a Windows platform. When you look at the hardware form factors, who are they designed for? Um, now, Daiquiri is designing a wearable device for an enterprise B2B solution. Why don't you for, describe for people who haven't yeah, seen sure. it what that device looks yeah, like? Yeah, so Daiquiri has a, a smart helmet. Uh, and Daiquiri spelled D-A-Q-R-I, if you want to look it up, uh, it has a smart helmet that's designed for an industrial worker, who, somebody who's on a factory floor and a coal mine, who's for gas and oil, people that are wearing construction hats, and basically empowering them with a, a co human computer interface, if you will, the, the most powerful human computer interface. So, and it's sort of but, like a, a shield kind of in Yeah, front so of the there's, a, like there's a, a head, heads up display, transparent heads up display that gives you an augmented reality view onto your world, into your environment. There's depth sensing cameras. There's there's an inertial measurement unit. There's all sorts of sensors in, into this hardware that you can, in a large form factor, you can put a lot of toys and bells and whistles into it, right? So it's great that we can go all out and put all these things into this device that you couldn't do in a consumer device because you, you have to scale it down. Um, and so this is designed for a specific worker. So when it goes to just when it goes to how this is all going to play out, I think I always look at it like the mobile landscape, and you have lots of different types of mobile devices for different types of users. When it comes to virtual reality, augmented reality. As hardware prices go down, you know, we've got 3D printing, you've got other ways to manufacture. You're gonna have a lot of different form factors out there, and you'll choose it based on your lifestyle. Is it something that I want in a work environment? Is it something, I'm in a hospital work environment, I'm in a factory floor, I'm in a school environment. If I'm in a social environment, clearly I'm gonna have fashion consciousness to it, um, and that's why it might take a long time before we're seeing head-mounted displays on people out here in the audience, just wearing it on every day. Google had that issue when they first launched their glass. It wasn't really socially acceptable to have a very Borg-like lens in front of your eye. Was, so, yeah. yeah. I was going to say I have kind of a related question to that. <clears throat> Just as someone who's not actually immersed in the hardware development in AR or yeah. VR, um, the, and, but I do have an obsession with headsets, mm -hmm. that being an EEG. Um, how long do you think, or actually do you think that headsets will be widely adopted before some other type of technology becomes uh, more practically a M more practical for AR, like I know there's talk like, about contact what? lenses. I mean, I know I think the main technology uses stereoscopic 3D, right, for actually rendering yeah. the display. 
but will something else emerge before the so, headset uh, takes I, off? I think what, what you're approaching is the problem of, of form factor right. and, and ergonomics in a way, right? right? And discrete. Right? Yeah, because so. for example, how many people in the audience have, have used uh, the Oculus Rift? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, how yeah. many have used it for like three hours in a row? <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, I don't see hands. So yeah, right. I saw one uh, hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's work developing. So wearability, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wearability and, and, uh, and like for, for continuous use, as, as we do currently with our, with our current devices, is a big issue and for factor will be. So if contact lenses will come and we can pack all those sensors in a contact lens, right. that, that may be hospitable. We don't know yet. Right. We're, we're, maybe how, we're a long way off from that, though, right? Uh, we're a long way off yeah. from that. Well, something but, I wanted to ask, I mean, on the topic of form factor, right, as we saw with Google Glass not being you know, generally well received outside of San Francisco, uh, <laughs> even problems within San Francisco, uh, you know, so are we at the point now with AR where it makes sense to really focus on enterprise, where it's just not really ready for consumers? I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering, there's a lot of talk about VR as something that people might use in the home that a gamer might, might have, you know, average consumer might, might buy with their PlayStation, but then for AR using it out in the world, I mean, does it really make sense to be talking about consumer applications at this point? I think for gamers it does. Gamers are early adopters to technologies, and you know that's why you see a lot of development in virtual reality and augment. You know, at my first company, Augment Reality, we went after the gamer, we went after the consumer market, uh, because you know the, they're early to accept these new technologies. They want the latest, greatest, but they're also very finicky about the experience. They expect you know gamers expect a triple A great content experience, and the technology should disappear. It should be invisible. It should just be about the experience. And it's going to take a while to get there. We, I mean, both in virtual or augmented and just this, these technologies, when you're dealing with all the hardware and software issues that come with it, it's going to take a while to get to that perfectly polished consumer level experience that you can get, let's say, on just a, you know, a tablet, touchpad type of experience. So it is going to take a while, but there's great work that's happening now, and there's great little mini experiences happening all over the place. Um, but for a mass adoption where everybody's wearing it, everybody's experiencing this stuff, it's going to take a while, I think. So just to go wrap up on your point, enterprise is where Daiquiri's focused because in the workforce, you need this technology. In entertainment, you want it. It's cool. It's a I want factor. In work, you need it because it's going to improve efficiencies. It's going to improve safety. It's going to make an economic difference to your bottom line and it's going to empower your workforce. So we're looking at things like knowledge transfer, you know, from the older generation as they retire to the younger. How do you teach them all of this manual's worth of content? You can give it to them in a heads-up display experience in real time. Uh, so those are the kinds of scenarios I think you're going to see take traction pretty quickly over the next five, over the next five years or so. And, yeah. and Dave, tell us a little bit about what ZSpace is doing with education. I mean, is it this, does that, sort of, that same argument apply to sort of, sort of what you're working on? It fits right there, I think. Because you, you have this, the social interaction. I think that's just, it, it, it's a huge key. I think putting something on your head, putting, putting all this gear on your head is a, is, a, is a huge barrier, right? And maybe we're all here because we believe everybody's gonna run around with this thing pretty soon, but it's, it's very difficult to imagine. It's very, for me, it's very difficult to imagine that a lot of us are gonna wear these things all the time, which is in direct conflict to, to all the big guys getting in the game, right? Saying, because, you might, you might watch their behavior and say, hey, we think there's a big consumer play in this thing. Mm -hmm. There's a big, huge volume consumer play here. But to me, it's not that, to me, it's really tough. I, I think the barrier to what people are wear is very small. It's, it's super light mm -hmm. glasses. And even then, what people really want is not to have to wear anything, right? right. So the, to, get them to, to get people to wear, to get a lot of people to wear something, the, the value is gonna have to be huge. Yeah, there, I, right? there well, might be a point. Sorry, there might be a point where the form factor may approach, for example, a 3D uh, glasses, those for movies or those that yeah. you guys using, right? So it, it's a matter of like probably use case and relative advantage. This is why, uh, like a professional use case or like a training context and a uh, productivity context, is where like people are more uh, accept to wear to have like their working devices plugged in more than, than consumer device, I agree, or like even a classroom maybe mm -hmm. right now. Uh, it's it hard to think of a classroom whole wearing uh, those devices, right, versus, versus a platform where they can share like seamlessly and quickly. But this is why, you know, the development of the technology will have to uh, be accompanied by robust like uh, research plan towards like wearability, ergonomy, form factor. 
the simple observation I make about uh, for cons on the consumer side is we're all glued to our mobile devices. Mm -hmm. You know, we're stuck. You walk around the streets, people are tripping over themselves because we want that digital feed all the time. You know, I, I, but you can put away a mobile device. I can you put can, my phone in my pocket. Yeah. I, if I'm wearing something, it's much harder to put away. Yeah, and so we've moved to the watch now, right? We've got the Apple Watch that just came out, so we're moving it closer to that instant feedback loop that we want, you know? And uh, it's interesting to see where that's going so you can get alerts on your watch and you don't have to reach into your phone or you get little haptic beats or whatever, things that are telling you, giving you information about the world around you that we're dying to have that connectedness, right, through, through the internet and stuff. So I see that, that transition happening and I think it's a natural evolution that we will all be wearing some sort of lightweight head-mounted display in the far future. Right. And so we're moving that way, you know, and then it'll look like your glasses or, you know, your glasses. That's what it has to look like. So how long do we project that to be? That's when I think the mass adoption is going to happen. But until then, classroom rooms, industrial floors, you know, those are the settings where you're going to see specific. Yeah, I would think that yeah. the early majority in the curve will still be uh, wearing stuff, willing to wear stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I mean, that's, I think that's the most exciting thing about the, this emergence of AR is like, perfect example, quick anecdote. anecdote. So I'm, I'm from New York, I ride the subway system all the time, and the M train that goes into Brooklyn, uh, it goes over a bridge, so you have cell service. Um, most of the time when you're on the subway, it's the only time where you're walking around in public and you're actually looking at people's faces. But the M train, you're going over the bridge, and I just like observed this one of the first times I was going over, everyone, it's like, it was a weird experience. I was like, wait, why is this subway ride different? And everyone's down staring at their <laughs> phone, and I'm like, ah, like, that's why, because we have, we, have we have cell service, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that AR, has is you know like has the ability for us to to look up you know and and be able to for one have good posture and mm -hmm. to kind of <laughs> like, <laughs> to yeah. like be right. able to see people while we're kind of like oh is that important no go away you know um, when you need so. a sensor and an app to remind you of sit up straighter sit up straighter you know yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one of the yeah flex sensor one of the factors we care a lot uh, about at Meta is is see the other world, but also be seen and being able to have eye contact with other people. Mm -hmm. right. uh, this is when like this disconnection from reality that we get with our current 2D platforms uh, uh, probably will, will be, uh, will heal from that in a way because it's... Yeah. I have a quick question for you, just because I'm on the EEG end of the spectrum and you seem to be sitting kind of right in the middle. Sure. Um, but what are you, what can you talk about in terms of embedded uh, EEG sensors and right. the combination of that and AR. So, like, what, what yeah. are you guys working on? It's really exciting. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm excited about, again, in the 4D context of pulling in data and then visualizing that data. So, pulling in data based on the internet of things, from the internet, from the cloud, from any kind of connected system in this entire world is being connected. Everything has sensors on it, and we're pulling data and turning the invisible visible. So when it comes to sensor-based data, biometrics, we can turn the invisible signals of our body visible. What does that look like? So we see a lot of you know, EEG readings. We see the, the squiggly lines. And that's you know, the data that we're looking at at the end of the day. You know, so I think about what is you know, the, the Fitbit of EEG. I mean, that's a bad example because that's steps that we're tracking different things. But right. what's that commercial application? And to me, I mean, it's really about being able to get that data in a way that's meaningful and, again, contextual and relevant to you in real time, perhaps. So if you're in the quantified self movement and you want to optimize yourself, to me, the instant feedback loop is really key to that. If I'm stressed out and I'm nervous, I'm up here on stage and I'm wearing a, an AR display that's telling me your heart rate's going up a little bit and you're a little unfocused and stressed and I've got that feedback right in this moment, I can take a deep breath, I can relax, and I'm adjusting myself and optimizing myself in real time, as opposed to looking at something at the end of the day and then trying to make sense of it. So that's an interesting application for AR for me, is having that information relatively in front of me. I mean, I think the Apple Watch will do that a little bit. You know, it'll actually give you a little bit of that feedback. Not even looking at it, but you know, you, maybe I'll feel a little pulse, maybe a haptic that tells me something. Um, but getting that feedback right away. So as I look at the converging, uh, to me, it's just learning about the body, improving yourself, improving society, and how do we use these tools for that? So I think there's going to be a lot of ways to look at it, you know, from the gaming side, how do you, you know, integrate that yeah. as well? But yeah. so Specifically for EEG signal and signals that come from the brain. So we, with sensors, we, we, we collect information from, from the external world. But what the potential of AR is also to interface external world with the internal world through, through a set of sensors, and EEG right. is one of the primary set of sensors that can tell like, and can use this as a, as a core interface between 
the person and the outer world, mm -hmm. right, bidirectionally. And this is what, so you can uh, understand more about with, with EEG signal, yes, getting signal about your, your a alertness uh, level and things like that. But a primary thing that, that is, that is a big delta of augmented reality, and, and we're performing research on that, it is, is the first technological device that allows sharing attentional spaces. Think about like a phone call, even if you're like hands-free in your call. Uh, sometimes you're disturbed because the person you're talking to, it doesn't share the traffic around you. So sometimes it's inappropriate in the moment that, it's, that it wants to push on some maybe emotional content, right? Because it doesn't, spare the, it doesn't share the attentional content. So, so the attentional uh, space that you have. So being able to share in an appropriate uh, brain appropriate way is a, is a key uh, feature of uh, future augmented reality. And uh, something I also wanted to ask about, we were talking also earlier about, you know, with form factors and different types of wearables here. I mean, uh, what about non-wearable AR? I mean, I know Dacry's done, done a bunch with that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering just the panel's thoughts on sort of, does that have, uh, just to pull an example, like, you know, what Google is doing with Project Tango with sort of scanning a room mm -hmm. with a tablet and kind of it's sort of, sort of, you know, clo closer to what, I, what, I've got, what I've got here, you know, where I'm looking away from it, but then I return to it. I mean, like, what's the potential for that? I mean, is that, is that you know, um, is, is there new ground to explore there, or is really the future all just about wearable? I mean, I think your, your project, ZSpace, addresses that, right? It's, a, it's for the classroom, it's a much more emerging, you can speak to it, a much more immersive experience uh, that's not a wearable device. Yeah, I think, I think the question might tie a little bit to, to social pressures. I have a feeling that the pendulum is going to swing back a little bit. I think when you, when you walk down the street and you see everybody looking at their phones like this, you're talking about posture, you don't want to, when a plane lands and, and people are just waiting for that moment when they can turn on their cell coverage and they look, everybody looks okay. down, right? It's kind of your subway story. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling the Apple Watch is a little bit like that because maybe, it, maybe it's moving that away where, you, where you're not stuck staring at it all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big deal. I think we want to look at each other and interact with each other because that's the way we've evolved for mm -hmm. however long it's been to, to, to kind of socially interact. And that's, there, 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 there's, there's a, that's too much barrier to be, to be looking at your phone while you're at dinner with, right, with whoever you're having dinner with. How do you like your potatoes? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I have a question for you, Dave, uh, because you have a, a product that is beautifully designed for delivering uh, 3D educational content, so more, more like going more down to the 3D content per se, 3D educational content. Uh, what do you think about like the, the third dimension adds in terms of training power? What I mean, for example, uh, is if you look, we know that that the medical errors kills. There's statistics showing that kills more than than major uh, illnesses in in the United States, right? Uh, and the, the way uh, doctors uh, MDs get trained is by relying mostly on rely either or on on uh, mannequins or on on 2D interfaces. What would, in terms of like deep content and connection with the brain, uh, had the, the third dimension? What is your experience with your? Product. It's really powerful because a lot of the information that we deal with is volumetric in nature, and med medical mm -hmm. data is, is just naturally that, just CT and MR, and then, and then educational models about the body are really powerful in a, in a VR environment, particularly one that's right on the desk in front where you have a, a device where you can interact. So in fact, mm -hmm. we sell these into medical schools too, and they use them to augment their, their anatomy labs. And I think that Medicine is a is a big big market for this for this platform right behind right behind education. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, happy to show you some stuff. Too. Yeah, it's great. I've seen yeah. it. I was over at Stanford experiencing it. It was amazing. And just to go along the non wearable experiences, I mean, you're holding a, a tablet, a, a, an iPad, and we have apps that run on you know on the Android or iPhone. And the tablets are great for short burst experiences. They're also great for um, environments where you are, do want to socialize or you have colleagues and you're talking about subject. And the augmented reality experience, even with a tablet, we actually have an anatomy app, a Daiquiri has one, and it, the idea of really replacing a gross cadaver, need, the need for a gross cadaver by having a, uh, an anatomical structure in front of you that you can explore in space, right? So you can move closer, move back. Using the and like, tablet you can camera. Have, right, and we can all be looking around, you know, a life full scale digital version and having conversation about systems and functions and things like that. And it's a much more engaging 
way to learn and to explore than if you're isolated on your own laptop yeah. or experiment. So We have yeah. a successful yeah. case. One of the companies that, that is in our ecosystems, uh, CMAX, is a company that, that works on our technology. And they develop is a Stanford uh, resident who's uh, created CMAX. CMAX is replacing the mannequins that they have at Stanford. It's like uh, a big investment. Mannequins may cost up to half a million because they simulate one to two set of uh, specific symptoms and the trainees uh, work on those mannequins. They replace it with uh, market tracker, life scale uh, patients, and because we have uh, untracking and, and point of contacts, the uh, specific action of the trainees uh, is generating specific reactions on the patient. And not only uh, they get trained on full scale, realistic uh, patients, but you also can collect data on medical decisions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a mm -hmm. tremendous power. Right. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of the uh, current challenges for AR. Um, one that one that someone was uh, was uh, asking me about yesterday was uh, what about uh, differing conditions of kind of how how do these devices perform when your environment is different? So for instance, I'm wondering like with the the meta glasses, like outdoors in sunlight versus indoors under artificial light. I mean. Um, how, what, what does that does that have any impact on on the function? Oh, uh, it, it does, right? If you're using a depth camera, of course, uh, with IR, uh, you, you're going to have an impact uh, in in sunlight, right? Wherever there's AR. But but uh, what we're seeing now is that many companies that provide like the components that we use in our in our uh, in our tech are are working to to. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, to get around that very quickly, like I, an IR camera may, may be channeled now. So not only this support like uh, using the outer world, but also uh, me and, and, and him like communicating with our glasses without interfering with our depth camera, and, and we can share the experience, right? So uh, looks like in terms of all, all, the, all these technologies are, are getting there to, um, to reduce and make all the, for example, latency unperceivable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so latency is, is a big issue that, that all of us are, are dealing with, uh, with different set of solutions maybe, but, but uh, this is what we care about, and this is, uh, it takes like R&D and research projects to go from like the way you set up the hardware to the way like the user uh, perceive latency and what we kind of lay out, uh, like a latency tolerator more or less. So uh, it takes a lot of, uh, cycles of research, but you know, if you know how to uh, nail it, uh, you will have support from the hardware companies, you will have software support, and, and a lot of these companies are switching our attention towards our space. Uh, there's a care way in and sort of what, what are the current challenges for what you're working on? Yeah, I mean, there's clearly challenges. Lighting conditions play a huge factor in this. Um, controlled environments are usually key. A lot of the demos you see out there and a lot of the use cases, there's usually an understanding of the environment beforehand. Um, that's, again, why I think a B2B industrial enterprise level of that AR is, is going to because you're, you know the space. You're in a classroom, you're in a factory floor, you know what the lights are like, and you can design and craft the environment to support the experience. If you're out in the real world, that's where it gets challenging, day, night, you know, a lot of trees around, buildings, reflective glass is, you know, a killer, all that kind of stuff. So there's people working on these challenges, you know, and ultimately there's probably gonna be a day where this entire world is mapped and scanned and trained for the overlay of digital content to register using, you know, GPS and all sorts of different sense, you know, um, scans <coughs> to actually have that uh, environment Conducent, right? Um, it's going to take a while. So I think it, it starts with little chunks at a time. So we can train this stage with this lighting if we wanted to and have a demo up here, but we would have had to prep that and do that, you know, and, and so those are kind of where we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. Yeah. And I yeah. think that, you know, the, the, uh, Given the challenges we have, we can, we can uh, win some of them now, some of them with time. Uh, the point is to nail when you can win what, what challenge, right? right. Uh, so the, the final challenge is to, is, to, uh, is to add performance to human beings. Uh, this is what we want without disconnecting them from, from reality and from other human beings. Right. And in order to, to do that, it will take cycles. Probably we will solve some training uh, as challenge first. Then we will solve uh, other like a productivity challenges, mm -hmm. and, and eventually we will we will solve the performance challenges by by this like army of hardware, software researchers moving uh, moving towards this this objective. Mm -hmm. And let's get and integration uh, oh, of sensors, by the way. Uh, right before you talk, or right. while, 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 uh, let's get one or two questions That's for the great. audience. So, uh, okay, so God, if we have a microphone, I think there's over there. Uh, Connor, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I mean, I guess as an outsider, just uh, the. 
looking in and, and watching this gradual progression of AR and, and thinking about the future human experience. And I, like, for me, I'm, it's, I'm very passionate about techno ethics. I teach a course called Designing Consciousness, and we basically just talk about the future of humanity and how all of these different technologies little are going stuff to, like that. Yeah, yeah, little stuff. Light stuff, yeah, right. But, uh, you know, like, there's, there's a lot of scenarios, like, uh, you know, especially with embedded biosignals and, uh, you know, being and having renderable environments where we are subjected to information that's relevant to the things we care about. Uh, like, how do we design or how do we set up design constraints to, to address those mm -hmm. kind of ethical questions? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious as a, you know, like, obviously the, the point is to improve the human experience and at the, at the, while trying to mitigate the, yeah. uh, I guess, the kind of spam that we get from the world. Yeah. We'll so. come back to that. First, yeah. let's get yeah, a question yeah. from the audience. I think there was one down there. Come yeah. back to it. So in terms of designing ARs and VRs, I hear a lot of talk about not introducing things that are unnatural. So using cell phones as an example, a lot of people are saying that like sitting there texting all the time is unnatural. But I never grew up without that. That's not weird to me. I, I have a, a hard time communicating with my friends if I can't just send them a link about what I'm looking at. So do not think we're limiting ourselves by trying to design things only based on our current conceptions of what is natural for people to be using. Did, yeah, did anybody Good say question. that? Yeah. Sorry, is it, is, was that a question or just comment? Yeah. No, no, that's, that's a question. It's, do I mean, you not think we're limiting ourselves? Like, do you, we're not saying that you're not going to be able to, I guess, uh, if, if that is your point, if I got your point, uh, that we're not going to be able to tweet or to, or to send a Facebook uh, picture. Like, uh, our, our uh, devices will be packed with sensors so you can share your experience not only with, with your with the people around you physically, but you can share your experience with somebody in, in Sydney or in Rome, where I'm from, or you know, wherever else in, in, a, in, a, in those 100 milliseconds that we were talking about before, right? So we'll just probably expand, and, and this is our vision at least, mm -hmm. expand and, and put everything in a device that will, uh, that will be more naturally uh, blending our, our humanity into, uh, into the world without you know, uh, giving up on, on digital content and, and tech. Anyway. I think it's a, it's a really good point that, that a big part of the world likes to do things the way that the way they want to do it. And, and, we're, and I don't think we're saying that's not the right way. Mm -hmm. I think we're saying the technology up to now is kind of hasn't let us do it in more kind of natural, more mm -hmm. with, with, with kind of built in social interaction. Right. I think we've got a long way to go to make it more personal first right. and not, not to rule out other forms, because it is magic and computer generated anyway. So you, it's only limited by your imagination, right? You should be able to do what you want to do. So I don't, I don't think it's kind of a right and a wrong thing. I think we just haven't been able to do enough of the stuff that we're kind of wired up to do yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So you're relying yeah. on the brain, on knowledge of the brain uh, in a more profound way. This is what we should care about and we are caring about. The time on the panel has unfortunately run out. It's flown by. So let's uh, thank our panel for a great discussion. And uh, I think they'll be, they'll be around today at the conference for people to continue discussions about future of humanity, other, other pish posh like that. So thank you all. That was fun.